truth. The world is a real rabbit hole. It's a never never land. A lonely, very alien place for a Christian at times. If we're not careful, today, a person can easily lapse into confusion and desperation and find his mind divided, double-minded. In Lewis Carroll's classic Alice in Wonderland, it's really interesting when you think about Wonderland as the world and we're all Alice. She's the most responsible character in the story. She's actually the only real person. She's the only true character in the whole story. Alice's innocence makes her a perfect target for social criticism in Wonderland. She's a child in a strange world, and her only purpose is to escape the afflictions around her. In Wonderland, to grow and mature leads to inevitable corruption, and the implication for the world there is the longer you're here, the more corrupt you become. Growing up in Wonderland means the death of the child. Maturing in the world means the death of innocence. And of course, there's the theme of nonsense. There's no point or purpose to trying to decipher it into logical meaning because to do that just works against the intention altogether. Carol wrote this into the story, of course, because he wanted his nonsense to be random, senseless, unpredictable, and without rules much like the world we see before us today. But of course, the primary theme throughout is madness, for which there seems to be no remedy. Reality is upside down. Morals are upside down. There are plenty of rules in Wonderland. The laws seem like a parody of real justice. The Queen of Hearts, for example, thinks nothing of violating the law, which protects people from illegal prosecution. In the croquet game, anyone can be executed for reasons only known to the sovereign queen, who acts as though she is a divinity with the power to take and give life. The funny thing about the law in Wonderland is that the operative principle of Wonderland is chaos. And so injustice is the logical consequence of living in Wonderland. Survival of the fittest is the rule it's really anarchy and there's no way to change the law because no law really exists. In the scene where Alice is walking down the path, going no particular place, and she encounters the Cheshire Cat, Alice asks, Excuse me, would you please tell me which way I ought to go from here? Well, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. I, I don't much care where. Well, then it doesn't matter which way you go. Now does it? <laughs> Indecision. Double-mindedness. Welcome, my friends, to episode two of Growing Pains in the Faith. We'd like to welcome you to the Armor of Truth mobile app. Please take a moment to click around and investigate. Search out the app and contact us at hello at armoroftruth.net and let us know if you find any trouble, any problems, any suggestions. Uh, we need your help in perfecting this so that this can be our platform for everything. This week we're starting at verse 5, so we'll read the text. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, doubting nothing, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The grass withers and the flower fades, but this is the living, eternal Word of God, and it stands. Well, James recommends prayer for wisdom in the context of enduring trials. Verses 5 through 8 present God's offer to help those of us who are facing trials. Notice here that it's is that God makes the offer available, but in this case, it's up to the believer. The believer is required to act, right? Sanctification is a synergistic process. That synergism means that we work together with God on this. And so verse 5 picks up the word lacking, back from verse 4, and let perseverance have its perfect work so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So verse 5 today picks up, but if any of you lacks wisdom, so we see 
there's a transition here. Lacking from verse 4 to if any of you lacks wisdom in verse 5 shows us that there is a connection. The repetition here shows the reader that the context or the subject in verse 5 is still trials. The context in verse 4 was trials, so the context in verse 5 is trials. That's how we know what he's talking about. So verse 4 is where James is assuring readers that perseverance, when it is finished, the believer will have everything he needs, the virtues and the strengths to respond to trials. Verse 5 here is where James is exhorting the reader uh, how to respond during the period of a trial, specifically uh, or testing before before that perseverance has been completed, before that work is complete, while we're still new at it. So before we have sufficiently matured spiritually, when, when trials are still a confusing mess for us, well, James is telling us here that God has provided the release valve for us, a ripcord to pull in order to bail out of the chaos to find peace in God in any situation. If anyone lacks wisdom, he or she may have it simply by asking for it. And so here, asking in the text here, if uh, let him ask God, uh, this, this, this verb here suggests a command. It means that if you want wisdom, you must ask God, meaning that there is no other source and God wants us to depend on him. Remember, God is training us and spiritually forming us and teaching us so that we will learn how to ask him more and more and come to depend on God for absolutely everything, because that is the point. That's where we're safe. That's where we're protected. That's where we will be provided for. It's where we find peace and comfort from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Proverbs 4, verses 5 through 9, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget and do not turn away from the sayings of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. Now, this is King David teaching a young Solomon, and God has inspired and preserved his wisdom across the millennia for us to put to use today. What we see here is that the first step in getting wisdom is to value it, understand what its value is, which is to say value God's wisdom, which is eternal and unchanging and reliable in all circumstances. The text of the, the underlying uh, Hebrew language here, this verb forget, is uh, kana, which really suggests uh, to buy or to purchase, you know, to possess the idea is that wisdom will cost you something, but it is a valuable commodity that is worth it. So getting wisdom really doesn't require a massive intellect. That's really important here, too. It doesn't require savvy or great abilities of discernment or any special opportunities, but it does require us to make a choice to leave behind our own understanding and to perhaps risk going against the current of the world and being thought of as strange or Maybe they'll call you a fundamentalist or puritanical or maybe even today a violent extremist or a white Christian nationalist or something that they'll make up. When we make that choice to seek wisdom from God, we also must be willing to accept the consequences for walking with God in his will. Because we cannot expect the world to congratulate us for our decision to walk with God while everyone else is walking according to the standard of the world. If you want wisdom, God is saying, come and get it. It's a free gift, but it does come at a cost in the world. Again, this is how our Father trains us for endurance and grace in a hostile world. He's given us very simple instructions for how to deal with the most complex trials and tribulations. Plainly, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. Now, once we have God's wisdom, then... Very simply, we are to keep it, to not turn away from God's wisdom. Now, both David and Solomon did turn away from God's wisdom. They decided to follow their own counsel, and both sinned mightily. Solomon was one of the wisest men to ever live. And Solomon valued wisdom so much that he asked for wisdom above all other things. God bestowed it on him. He bestowed great wisdom on Solomon because Solomon asked for it. Now, tragically, late in life, Solomon did turn away from God's wisdom. So the point here is this. Getting wisdom is a simple act. Even the most brilliant person in the world can fall 
and turn away from God's simple and attainable wisdom. The level of one's intellect is no measure of faith. Getting God's wisdom is simple and attainable by anyone who will ask God. And then that wisdom will preserve us and keep us safe. Uh, to the world, the most valuable possession is typically money or status or another person. But for the Christian, God's wisdom is the most valuable possession. And we are to love, value, and honor that wisdom. A good definition of wisdom, right? We need that. Wisdom is, in this context here, is understanding the nature and purpose of trials and knowing how to respond to them so that we have victory over them and we come away from them more spiritually grounded and mature. That's our goal. That is the purpose of our whole study. It is God's nature to give generously and without reproach or shame, which means that God doesn't scold us for asking Him. And he will not rebuke us for what we lack when we come to him. Right? If any of you lacks, ask God, and wisdom will be given to all who ask. Now, in verse 5, we have another harmonization with the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Ask, seek, and knock. Ask, it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened. That's a progressive intensity in those actions. Ask, seek, knock. So prayer is like asking, and everyone who asks receives. So receiving is the reward of asking. Prayer is like searching for God and His Word and His will. And whoever seeks, finds. So finding is the reward of seeking. Prayer is like knocking until the door is opened. So we seek the kingdom when we pray and ask God. And entering into his presence is the reward of knocking, which is the best reward of all. So the point with all this is, folks, is that getting God's wisdom is a simple task. Ask and it will be given. We don't pray for this out of duty. We don't pray to merely complete the daily task, to check off the obedience box. God values persistence and passion in prayer. Persistence and passion in prayer to God shows that we are like Jesus because he was always praying to the Father persistently praying to the Father. And so persistent prayer gives glory to God. John 15, 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. 1 John 3, 22, And whatever we ask, we receive from him. 1 John 5, 14, If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Verse 6 says, He must ask in faith, doubting nothing. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Well, he must ask in faith. Underlying the English word faith here is the original Greek word pistis, which translated in context here carries the predominant idea of trust or confidence in God and what he has said he will do. The one who is doing the praying must affirm and internalize as self-evident reality that, that what God has said is true and can be trusted. Faith is to trust that God is absolutely dependable and that his response or no response to the prayer is always right and always for our good. It's always just. It's always perfect. Although nothing in God prevents him from giving wisdom to his people, there might be a barrier that exists in us that prevents it. And that barrier is doubting. So they must believe and not doubt. It means their faith must be more than just acceptance of a creed, affirming some doctrine. So James is again describing what the faith looks like and what God sees as faith, doubting nothing. The underlying Greek term translated as the English word doubting or to doubt is uh Diakarino, it's to hesitate, to be at variance with oneself, to waver, to be unsteady, or to simply be inconsistent, to do battle with oneself, to waver between two opinions. So if you're trusting God one minute and then the next minute you're questioning why things are so hard, or being impatient or lacking grace, that is doubting. Holding a position 
in your mind that is contradictory or opposed to God's will. Now, James builds a really excellent word picture here, graphically illustrating this mindset uh, by the surf or the surge of the sea. So think of the surf at the beach where you stand there about knee deep in the water. The waves are constant, the swirling, the, the water is just constantly churning, swirling, swelling, cresting, breaking, advancing and retreating. Completely unstable. But not only that, James adds another element to it. And the wind drives it. It's a maelstrom out there. It's the waves and the churning surf. It's also blown or driven and tossed by the winds. The characteristic of faithful prayer that moves God to respond is steady, stable, sure, constant, unwavering faith. Jude also gives us some insight here about what unfaithful looks like. In verse 10, But these men blaspheme these things which they do not understand. These are men who are clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea. There's that imagery again. Casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. So how about that? Jude 13. Lack of faith is demonstrated by bad character. Clouds without water are good for nothing. They bring no life-giving rain, and they only block out the sun. They just exist for themselves. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all generously, without reproach, and it will be given to him. Verse 6, But he must ask in faith, doubting nothing, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, unstable, driven and tossed by the wind. We're at verse 7 now. For that man ought not expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Now, syntactically here, or the order of the words here, shows us a great deal about how James intends for this doubter to be perceived by the reader. So that phrase, that man, it's gar ekonos anthropos. James seems to be making a deliberate point here about the character of the one who wavers between two opinions and questions or holds ideas that oppose God's nature or character. For that man ought not to expect, rather than just identifying some man, now it becomes a specific charge, right? This word, oyamai, or to suppose, to expect, it means to imagine oneself falsely, to see oneself in a better light than one should. It's wrong judgment, having a skewed or false opinion of oneself. But to put it more simply, it really means to have like an inflated self-image, an inflated self-regard. So James has made a point here to ensure that it is understood that this doubter, or the one who is doubting, is a person who is wavering between God's will and his own opinions, not trusting God, but trusting himself and his own experience. And I think we've all been there. And, well, it doesn't get any better for the doubter in verses uh, in verse 8 here as we move on through this. James has given us a picture of true faith by vividly describing what lack of faith or unbelief looks like. So now in the last, uh, the last verses here uh, of our study today, James continues to make this distinction clear. Verse 8, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Double-minded is, uh, it's dipsukos in the Greek, which literally means double-souled. It means double-souled. Di, D-I, there's the two, the double and the sukos. It looks like psychos if you look at it. This is a kind of wavering and instability, this double-souled, that, that goes far beyond just getting it wrong when it comes to prayer. Double-mindedness, or dipsukos, is a brand of instability that is present and apparent in all a person does. Double-mindedness is a kind of indecisiveness or an inflated self-regard that is so pervasive that it neutralizes or spoils the person's whole ability to be effective in their personal life or their business life or their social life and certainly their spiritual life. And what James is making clear to us here is that we need to be on alert for these characteristics in our own lives because the consequences are destructive. James is saying point blank that a person like this 
will not receive anything from the Lord. Now, let's make sure here that we differentiate clearly between a person who is self-righteous, double-minded doubter, versus a person who just feels inadequate or that their faith is weak. There is a major difference here. We can look at Mark chapter 9 to get the idea here, starting at verse 24. Now, this is where the father brings the son who happens to be possessed with a, a demon. And the father faithfully brings the son to Jesus. And he says, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father cried out and was saying, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Now, it seems like the father here is doubting. Right? At first, he says, if you can do anything, please help us. But that wasn't directed at whether or not Jesus could actually do anything. The father has already proven that he has faith in Jesus because he brought his son to Jesus. The if here is about the man's sense of of feeling inadequate. It's about the man's sense of uh, his weakness of faith. This is why he cried, I do believe, help my unbelief. It's basically, he's saying, he's making that prayer, increase my faith. So Jesus told him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. When we trust God as true in all things and take God at his word, then everything God promises is possible. Did you hear that? Did, did you catch that? When we trust God as true in all things, and when we take God at his word, then everything God promises is possible for us. The father already believed in Jesus' power to deliver the boy. Why else would he have brought him to Jesus? But he also recognized his own weakness his own shortcomings, and his sense of inadequacy is what he recognized. And that's something that we all experience at times. So the father pled with Jesus, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, increase my faith. So the man's weakness in faith was not, was not like the, the, the doubter, right? It was not a rebellion against God or somehow in conflict with God's will or promise. The man did not deny God's promise. He wanted it more than anything, but somehow it just seemed too good to be true. He didn't feel like he deserved it, perhaps. Luke 17, at chapter 5, it says, And the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you have faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So with this man here, with his faith the size of a mustard seed, his weak, tiny faith, the man brought his son to Jesus, and he expected his son to be healed, and he cried out to Jesus, help my unbelief, and both of those prayers were answered. That request, help my unbelief, that is something a man only says when he has faith. That's not something that an unbeliever struggles with. Charles Spurgeon said, when a man has no faith, he is unconscious or unaware of his unbelief. But as soon as he gets even a little bit of uh, faith, like maybe a mustard seed of faith, well, then he becomes aware of his inadequacies very quickly and the greatness of his unbelief. The difference here between the doubter and the one who is just feeling inadequate is that this man was not facing in both directions at the same time. He wasn't dipsukos, right? He wasn't double-souled like the double-minded doubter in verse 8. He was aware of his weakness, and he had set his heart to believe. So this is a very different circumstance, a very different experience, and a very different outcome. As we see, joyously, Christ responded to this demonstration of true faith, and his prayers were answered, and his son was healed. So in response to this kind of faith, God will give wisdom to those who ask for it and enable them to persevere in times of trial. If any of you lacks wisdom, faith, if you lack strength, if you lack anything good, then ask God who gives and gives and gives generously because he loves his children. James 4 Verse 6, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near 
to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Right? That's where you go in your Bible and you put a little P beside the verse because that's a promise. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. So, in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, Alice asked the Cheshire Cat, Tell me, please, which way should I go from here? And the Cheshire Cat just says, Depends. Do you have any idea where you want to go? Restlessness and confusion are the marks of a double-minded person. The double-minded person is always in conflict with himself. This kind of inner conflict is a barrier between God and that person so that that person can never confidently trust or depend on God's grace and promises. The double-minded person has no defined direction and as a result doesn't get anywhere. Such a person is unstable in all he does, not just prayer. The double-minded person is unstable in all his ways, like an animal with a head at either end of its body, constantly trying to walk in two directions at once. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus declared, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. The things of the world, the love of the world, and the pride of life are so opposed to God's nature that it is impossible to love either one of them without hating the other. The world is at enmity with God. And those who try to keep one foot in the world and one foot in the church will become unstable in all their ways. You can trust it, because the Lord has told us that. His Holy Spirit has given us that through this inspired, infallible, fully sufficient word. If you or someone that you know struggles with trying to split your love between two opposing forces, you can't do it. Right, You can't split your attention or your love between two opposing forces. Well, if that's you or someone you know, here are some recommendations. Read the scriptures. Study the scriptures. Do it daily. Make a practice of memorizing scripture verses. It's a fine thing to do because you're planting seeds in your mind that you need to study, right? Memorization of, of verses is, is not enough, but it does plant seeds in your mind to move out some of the useless material that's, that's in there already. Plant that seed in your mind and internalize the Word of God so that whenever you think, you begin to think in Scripture. That whenever you dream, you begin to dream in Scripture. Whenever you speak, you speak in Scripture. This is the true antidote for anxiety in the world. If you're struggling with anxiety and stress, this is the antidote. It is the antivirus software for your mind Arm yourself with the Word of God. Internalize it. The Word of God is what produces faith in us. That's Romans 10, 17. Likewise, you must pray. Ask God for wisdom, but ask in faith, because God gives freely what is good to those who ask Him. And it's good to ask for an increase of faith. Thank you, my friends, for joining us for episode two of Growing Pains in the Faith. God bless you, my friends. We'll see you next time. Faith is resistance.